today, we're going to have a panel with some of the royalties of the open source movement in Bitcoin. Bitcoin itself is an open source software which was published with the MIT license. It's code published in C++, which was ported in many other languages. Two of the participants today have worked with the Bitcoin core code. The other one has forked it twice. I checked her GitHub this twice? morning. <laughs> twice. <laughs> there is the Bitcoin C++ one and the Golang one. Oh, uh, okay. I took a look. Right. And you're six years behind with the C++ one. <laughs> so, I'm done with C++. <laughs> basically, we have people who work in open source and have developed very great projects. And I think I should stop talking too much and ask them questions because you're here to hear them. And I'm going to start to my left and ask them how they first discovered open source because it's counterintuitive. Why should your work be available, available to everyone around the world for free? So, as you can probably guess from my attire, I belong to the Shadowy Supercoder tribe. But it's, uh, it hasn't been like that uh, forever. Like when I was 16, I was still a kid playing a lot of computer games on my Windows PC. And every time when I bought a new graphics card or a sound card, there was a CD attached to it. And I had to install driver, drivers uh, for this hardware, and it was a really painful experience uh, quite often. And uh, around that time, when I was 16, I got introduced to uh, the Linux operating system. And uh, I was really surprised that everything just worked out of the box on my machine. And that got me really intrigued, like, how, how is that possible? So I started to dig more and to understand what, what's going on. And then I realized that the core part of the Linux operating system is something called the Linux kernel. And uh, I, as I was digging deeper, I realized that this is the biggest open source project uh, there is out there. And it's driven by thousands and thousands of volunteers writing drivers for essentially any hardware out there. And it's been working since, I think, 1991. So this is this was really amazing back then, and still it was amazing. It is amazing for me uh, up to date. So that's and how I got introduced. And then you ended up working on Linux. Sorry. And then you ended up working on Linux. Yeah, I mean not on the Linux kernel, but uh, I was fiddling with other parts uh, of the Linux uh, software distribution as well. What about you, Val? How did you get into open source software? How did you discover it first? Yeah, that's fair. I guess technically I was Linux as well, but um, my first thought when I hear that question was when I first uh, looked at Bitcoin Core, when I was first like getting into Bitcoin development, like figuring out what I wanted to work on. And um, yeah, it was a really good learning experience. I feel like I was also kind of uh, slightly later looking into different Lightning implementations. And I think um, my takeaways were, I don't think I'm down with C++ and um, I think between like working on layer two and working on layer one, I'm a little bit more inspired by the layer two uh, use case because I think it's a little more focused on bringing Bitcoin to the average person, whereas I feel like layer one is more focused on maintaining the hard money properties of Bitcoin. Um, and uh, also I felt like uh, lightning implementations tend to be a little bit more, a little bit more beginner friendly, whereas with Bitcoin core, I feel like if you're not starting out like fairly advanced, it can be a little bit more of an uphill battle to have like meaningful contributions, get like pull requests with you. But um, obviously that's like in flux depending on project priorities. But um, yeah, so it was, it, was really, it was really inspiring to just be kind of, I mean, I was studying computer science, but to be like kind of a random person, just be able to show up with no, no networking connections or anything to the people on the project and still be able to make contributions and just... The, that good first issue tag <laughs> open to anybody, so yeah. What about you, Nicholas? Because I know you worked for Microsoft at one point, so yeah. how did you get into open source? Well, not directly to with Microsoft. I was a Microsoft certified tech trainer, so basically I was learning about uh, .NET technology and like teaching it to businesses. And it's true that at the time, like open source was not really in the cloud of Microsoft. Yeah, time has changed. I was mainly like uh, writing article on some website that was called Code Project at the time because I just like coding and so I wanted to write about it and it turns out it was kind of a community website uh, that people was listening to so I I was start work, writing them. Then my about Bitcoin uh, open source um, 
how I discovered it. So when, when there was this, uh, the crash of MTGOX, I learned uh, about Bitcoin and I was kind of surprised that people that lost their life saving in MTGOX was still very defending Bitcoin uh, without hesitation. So I was, it's, it's, it's not a normal situation for, of a normal person that gets scammed. So I, I, I tried to look on that. And uh, when I came, so it was 2014, there was very few uh, resources concerning Bitcoin and it was very technical stuff. Uh, so the only way to learn about Bitcoin was actually reading Bitcoin Core source code and at the time as well Bitcoin J, uh, so the Java library. So I was reading the code and I don't know, but on my mind, every time I try to learn something, I, I, I need to try to code it to really understand it. And it's kind of like, if you are a writer, very often you, you write ideas like uh, or something we want to say, then you come back and like you rewrite and try to simplify stuff. Mm -hmm. On my side, it's kind of the same um, feeling <clears throat> with open source. I just try to learn, I write in code, then I come back and I try to make it as simple as I can. And the end result is something that, that actually other people can use. And so it was my first contribution to Bitcoin. It's an Bitcoin library. It's a library in C Sharp. If you want to, to code on Bitcoin on top of C Sharp, you will use this library. And uh, it, this library starts as a learning experience for me to learn about Bitcoin. And it grew up, it grew up. And then now, basically, I'm always building on top of that, that, that was N Bitcoin. Then after uh, like N Explorer, you take the project and like BTCP server finally. So it's always growing and still learning and always refining the process. It's uh, never ending, but it's always the same, uh, the same move. Yeah. I have to remark that I'm very surprised that none of them spoke about torrents because those were spiritually very close to Bitcoin. The idea of file sharing and making the software like uTorrents and BitTorrent the protocol. This was open source and it was the only way in which they could not go to jail for developing that kind of software that was enabling <laughs> piracy. And I used to pirate a lot of stuff as a teenager, so I think that was my exposure to open source. And maybe Firefox, but that was the browser I was using. So let's talk about your Bitcoin projects in particular. I guess, Pavel, I'm not even sure about which one I should ask you, because at Satoshi Labs you developed mm -hmm. BIPs, you developed SLIPs, which are Satoshi Labs improvement proposals. Mm -hmm. You worked on Trezor. If you're using 12 or 24 words to back up your wallet, he's the guy responsible for it. <laughs> he created BIP39 along with Slush, who's probably here mm -hmm. also. So which project do you honestly want to talk about right now? Trezor? Mm -hmm. yeah, maybe I want to talk about a little bit what happened before, uh, before, before Trezor. And I want to maybe a little add to something to the previous question. Uh, before before I started Satoshi Labs and Trezor, I've been, I had uh, uh, worked for a company called Susa Linux, and mm -hmm. uh, this is a <coughs> Czech, Czech company, uh, one of the commercial Linux uh, distribution providers, uh, other being Red Hat and uh, Canonical with their Ubuntu. And there I realized that while these companies are trying to get their customers on the free market, uh, via marketing and sales and uh, stuff like this. Uh, on the engineering, there is a lot of uh, there is a lot of collaboration going on because everything in this for, for free distribution is basically open source and built on top of open source. And uh, we, we had a really good uh, conference as well, where people from these companies were collaborating together. And then I understood one really basic thing that. Uh, our time on the planet Earth is limited, so it's such a waste when we are uh, still trying to reinvent the wheel. And uh, at that point, it became my moral imperative to everything I do to do it as an open source, because uh, then somebody else can pick up where I left. And uh, basically, I save time for other people so they can m do more exciting stuff. And uh, like you said, uh, in uh, 2012, we started to uh, work on Trezor with Flash. And he had a different background, but he came to the, ultimately to the same realization that uh, open source is very, very, very good for not only these reasons, but for, also for others. So I was really lucky to have uh, this understanding that we should start uh, Trezor as uh, open source project. 
and uh, yeah, I mean, this this is the the main project I am still contributing to. But of course, I'm contributing to other projects and Bitcoin Core. Uh, I don't know, BTC Pay server. The, the very good thing about the open source is that if you are something missing or if something is broken, you can just look into the code and try to help uh, the developers to basically uh, fi fi fix the issue. And you can just say, hey, this is the way how it's fixed. Valentine, I know that you work on LDK, which is the Lightning Development Kit. It, it is very exciting to find that sort of development happening in Lightning because you're pushing Bolt 12 and some stuff that maybe Lightning Labs is not so keen on. So what's your experience with open source and what is exciting with LDK? Um, yeah, so I guess to back up, LDK is the Lightning implementation I work on. And the idea is that instead of a, a node that you run, it's a library so you can embed Lightning in your application as opposed to running a binary, basically. And um, yeah, it's, it's been really awesome. As you said, we're working on Bolt 12, which uh, brings static invoices. You can have subscriptions eventually, just a lot of cool payment features like that. And um, yeah, and then after that, building on top of that, we're planning to work on async payments. So I think, to me, that's one of the most important features in Lightning, because I would basically hesitate to recommend Lightning to someone like my grandma without this feature, because if she was running a Lightning node on her phone, she wouldn't be able to receive a payment if her phone was in airplane mode or in do not disturb mode. So I think that's a really important feature. And um, yeah, we're also working on uh, getting Anchor's implementation in so we can build uh, dual funding and splicing on top of it. And um, yeah, I think. LDK aims to be very performant as well and uh, use very little disk space. So because of that, I think we tend to be more suited for mobile than some other uh, more like server focused implementations, basically. And um, yeah, that, that has a ton of unique challenges, but uh, it's, it's pushed us towards developing some really cool features as well, such as like rapid gossip sync, so that uh, rather than taking up hundreds of megabytes of um, cellular data, uh, syncing the gossip graph in Lightning, you can just sync like a few hundred kilobytes from a semi-trusted server and you'll have all the same information and be able to uh, pathfind on your phone. Although eventually we also want to get trampoline payments, which would allow um, outsourcing pathfinding to more beefier nodes that have the bandwidth to have all that data. So yeah, it's been really fun. It's in Rust. So, you know, memory safe, no buffer overflows or anything like that. It, ideally, <laughs> and um, yeah. Nicholas, what about BTC Pay? Why is this open source? You decided in 2017 that BitPay is not good enough anymore, and you decided to build something better. But why did you not start a company or something, and you decided to go for an open source project that anyone can copy? So. There is several reasons, actually. Um, so why, why I started BTC Pay Server is that first, when there was this blockchain war, like we saw that uh, there was lots of private interest trying to get a consortium together to try to um, change bitcoins rather than him, them having to change uh, to change it, and. Uh, because lots of people were relying on them, we become in a very dangerous situation where even if the protocol of Bitcoin is decentralized, even if the miners are not very centralized, we still end up in a situation where there is a small group of people that can try to um, impose their will. So uh, like I, I created BTC Pay Server because I, I didn't want that to happen. Like People, when they build on Bitcoin, they should use, preferably, open source software because like it's a... Uh, it, when... 2,000 people are running open source software and there is a change that is done and they don't like it, they always have a way out. So that, that was important for me. Uh, so uh, why, why open source? Uh, there is several so solutions. First, I'm a developer. You know, I'm like a very simple guy. I don't want to talk to regulators. I don't want to do anything that is a, a big pain in the ass. So I just want to code and focus on coding. And when you work on, bit, on um, open source, you are laser focused on solving like specific problem for user and there is nothing standing on the way. You have like unlimited freedom. And uh, you, you are not, you are not uh, 
your mind is not split into trying to do marketing, uh, into trying to up to, uh, to regulators and stuff like this. So it means that it's also way easier to spread. Uh, like if, you're, if you make a company, it's very hard to spread because every time you jump in a jurisdiction, then the regulator will come to you and then you need to bribe one people or another. Or they don't call it bribe, they call it like license. And it's always changing and it's like it's never ending and you're not focusing on real things that matter, which means your user, at the end of the day, your user is what matters. And I, I want it to be as free as possible of uh, distractions. And like I, th I thought like open source was the way, way to go on that. And uh, yeah, I, I don't regret it. Open source is not always easy, but like there is no regret on that. I would have be if, I, if I did a company, it would not have been that far, yeah. Code is usually regarded as intellectual property. So if you produce it, you might have some expectations from it. Most people think in terms of I'm going to build this and I'm going to sell it for millions of dollars to a bigger company and I'm going to retire on, on some island. But you guys did not do that. You didn't do any of that. You decided that your work is going to be available to everyone around the world so they can download, they can modify it, they can copy it, they can improve it. But why? And how can you make money off of that? Because that's another issue. Mm -hmm. You are right that uh, sustainability and funding can be a huge issue of open source project because of all the reasons you, you mentioned. And uh, I guess in Trezor case, it was a little bit easier because we are an open source project that is hardware, so we can actually make money by selling the hardware. So same goes, for example, uh, uh, the Prusa printers company. They have the same concept. They are also based in Prague. Uh, Alan Bits is making some money by uh, selling all these uh, crazy gadgets that you can uh, connect to the, the, their server. Uh, but of course, there are other models, and I'm I'm really happy that there are organizations uh, such as, uh, for example, Spiral and uh, Brink, who support open source developers, and this is very helpful if you don't have uh, really time to build some kind of organization around your uh, project. Uh, I think Nicolas can then talk about uh, the foundation they have, uh, they have for the BTC pay server. If you are over a certain size, then you can pull it off. But if you are a small hobbyist, then probably looking for some grant is uh, much, much easier for you. So this, this is the way how you can uh, basically make your open source project sustainable but if you are starting the open source project, this is not, uh, these are not really the questions you have in your mind. You have this, you have this problem you want to fix, and uh, you want maybe other people uh, all over the world to help you fix the issue as well. So you will hit this uh, financial problem and sustainability problems much, much later down, down the, uh, in the, in, uh, later in time. Yeah, I feel like. Uh monetization is a really interesting issue in terms of lightning implementations because obviously like some of the implementations are at for-profit companies. Uh, Spiral is a little bit unique because as an organization our goal is not to make money it's just to foster the Bitcoin ecosystem basically um, because Jack Dorsey really likes Bitcoin. Thanks Jack. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, whereas so but yeah it is really interesting to look at how the different implementations have kind of like made it work given their all the implementations are completely open source like lightning labs working on the taproot assets type of stuff and like a loop like rebalancing services and um eclair i believe makes money from like routing fees and being an lsp i believe an lsp is like a lightning service provider so uh lsp will basically manage channel liquidity on behalf of end users and um, Sea Lightning, I believe, is starting to try to monetize through Greenlight, although I'm not, I'm not clear how yet. It, it might be LSP stuff similar to Eclair. So um, yeah, it's a really open question, but uh, I really appreciate being at Spiral in general because I feel like we don't really have those pressures. So we get to kind of like push forward the cool like privacy features, security, and um, just usability without really caring about how uh, how to get a profit motive in there so and um yeah uh on my side uh, it's true that when i started pcp server so 
I was at the time, uh, I'm still is, employed in DigiLab in uh, Tokyo, that's, so I was receiving a salary there, so I'm kind of, I, I don't have hard uh, like financial issues on this side, so when I, I started it, I, like, I, I could not think about anything financial related for, for, for the project. I mean, like, if, if I had all the money on the world, what I would do, I would still work on BTC Pay, it's what, just what I wanted to do. So I, I really never thought about it. And um, what, what happened in, in our case, we got kind of lucky, like in the sense where I work on it, and then little by little, lots of people joining. And uh, so first was a Rockstar Dev, for example, and it was Cooks and Pav, and many, no, many, many others. So. And like it's growing up, and on my side as founder of the project, I just want you know to to contribute as, on the project as much as I want. Like code, of course, is a one way of doing it. And uh, like um, when when the project starts to grow up, not not every contributor are in my position, where I I was like financially secure. And uh, I think it was, I don't remember, it was probably Rockstar Dev or like Pavel Max at the time that said, oh, maybe we should think about doing something for receiving donations because at first we, we tried to get individual donations. So like, you know, everybody has this donation page and receive some sats. But it's kind of difficult because when a company wants to support a project, they don't want that to, they don't have, they don't want to think to one contributor, like uh, they don't want to think to one contributor in special, special, they want to help the whole project. So the idea was, okay, what if we create a structure where if those companies want to support us for one reason or another, then they can just pass by this foundation. And uh, it's kind of part of my open source uh, job, like I see it like this. It's like, okay, like what I can do to help to do this. And so we created this uh, BTCP server foundations. Uh, so the first uh, donator was, uh, so it was Square and uh, Square Crypto and, um, and uh, DigiLab, the, the, the company I was working on. And uh, the model has been very successful. Like uh, every year we get many, many different sponsors and we are so glad of everybody like, giving on this opportunity, but it's true that I was not thinking of any of that at the beginning, and it's, it's really when it reached a point where like some contributor had some uh, more time to spend on open source that we start looking into it, yeah. Now, this next question might be influenced by my interactions on Twitter. Why open source as opposed to source viewable or source available? Open source is where you can do whatever you want, Source viewable is where you can see the source, but you cannot use the code under certain conditions. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of described that earlier why I got into the open source, and uh, this was about uh, a limited time on the planet Earth and trying to save other people's time uh, so they can continue working on what I already did. And if the if the code is not li licensed under license that allows it, that the, the base, basic principle is, is broken. So you are giving away the code that is auditable, which is st still a great thing, but at the same time it doesn't s s solve this purpose. And actually it d does make things even more complicated because not only I have to reinvent the wheel, I also have to reinvent it in a way that uh, the owner of the previous code doesn't say, hey, you copied that from me, because I'm not allowed to do that. So this all creates a lot of, uh, lot of messy, messy situations, and uh, that, that's, that's my point of view, why I, why I stick to the, the licenses that allow you, you to reuse that code. But as I've said, uh, we, we were quite lucky that we were on, we, we basically were on the right spot and the right time and we started to do hardware projects. So I can imagine that it might be difficult for uh, certain software projects to be, be lucky in the same way. So I'm not saying this is bad. I'm just saying that from my point of view, it doesn't really serve the purpose why I really like working on open source. Um, 
I guess in some ways the question is kind of weird to hear because all the Lightning implementations are open source. So if you tried to start like a read-only Lightning implementation, everyone would just be like, what? <laughs> what are you doing? What are you talking about? But um, yeah, I think, I think for Spiral, it's kind of one of our big goals with LDK that we're, we haven't necessarily achieved yet is we want it to not make it a really a Spiral-centric project, but really make it a community project, like ideally have devs that are funded by other companies working on it. And um, we do have a few, but they're, the majority of contributors uh, are Spiral at the moment. Um, so that's a really important goal for us. And uh, I think it applies more so to our implementation than to other implementations, I think, um, because of the, the nature of the Spiral organization. So that's something really important. Um, I actually had a Twitch stream with Connor, the previous speaker, a few months ago that was, how do you get involved with contributing to LDK? So. Yeah, that's a that's a huge priority for us, and um, yeah, I think I guess we might get into the challenges later. But uh, one consequence of that is that when it comes to reviewing pull requests, we try to prioritize reviewing pull requests of uh, people that are trying to get involved in LDK, aka pretty much non-spiral contributors, over like internal pull requests, if that makes sense. So that's great, and like totally with the ethos of open source, but then it has like consequences because it can have like delays and stuff, which I don't think has been a huge problem for us or anything, but it's just, uh, yeah, something to keep in mind that, yeah, you can try to be as in the Bitcoin open source and community ethos, but uh, there's only a limited amount of review bandwidth. So, yeah. My question was a bit in the context of how do you monetize the software? And if you can check that mark for viewers, for making the code viewable, so you can prove that it does what you says it does. I guess you can also add another type of license on top and ask others who use the code to pay you. So you can add that legal obligation for someone who uses your code to pay you. But in Bitcoin, these source viewable or source available licenses are not popular. So I was trying to figure out why you're refusing this way of monetization and relying on something which is entirely available for any purpose whatsoever on the internet. Because I guess with BTC, it could have been easier if you ask people who use it to pay you a fee or something. I, I, well, what's the most important thing for open source projects? What do you think it is? Like, Users? I, like the mo I think the most important thing is like that the people that are developing it, like, or like contributing it, not only developing, or contributing in general, like you want to attract as many mind share in the project that you want. And like, if you start putting like uh, restrictions on the source code, then you won't attract that many people, or the people that you will attract will not be in the open source mindsets. Like, it's really important, I think, to be open just to be able to attract the right people. Like, um, same thing, for example, if BTC Pay Server was a company, and we, like, I would have need to find people working on it, and then you, you find type of developers that want to work on it, but those are like developers that are kind of uh, career, careerist mindsets. Say, okay, I want, I'm, a, I don't know, I'm 35 years old, I want this salary, and then I want to grow up. They are in, in a company mindset, and this is a p type of people you get if you try to, try to close the source. There is nothing wrong with this, but the most important things for the open source project is attracting the right people. And you don't, in the open source environments, the best way to attract the kind of people that you want is to make it as open as possible and so they can embrace it. I think that's, a, that's the main reason why it's not just source code available, but like everybody can play with it and modify it to attract the right people. I think Pavel opened up a very interesting conversation about our civilization evolving on the efforts of the ones that came before. So you're building on top of other people's work and improving and always dealing with new problems as opposed to trying to reinvent the wheel. Mm -hmm. So I would like each one of you to say what you think are the long-term effects and consequences and also advantages of open source software. Uh, I mean, I'm so aligned with the open source philosophy uh, in, in such a strong way that I'm really blind. Uh, I don't see any other way, basically. So this is like become 
my, myself, so it's very hard for me to talk why, why is it important, but the, the whole idea of not, not, not making other people repeat stuff is, is very, very, very powerful. Which I just did. <laughs> and I, uh, I have to say that uh, Nicola also mentioned that uh, it's about attracting the, the right mindset. And I really like to work people that have already absorbed the idea I have just described. Let me give you an example. Uh, f uh, in the last few months, I was uh, studying a lo lot about uh, cement, which is the material that uh, everybody knows, but just a few people know how does it actually work, and it's the most used uh, material in the world. Like it, it, is, it is much more used than any other material out there. And if you are building a house, you are not building that from scratch because there are the, the recipe for cement is known for 2000 years and the cement is just there so it just feels really awkward to not build on top of open source projects why, why would you like to build from scratch it just smells like it's just some kind of like ego thing so yeah that's what i probably wanted to say to that no i think yes this was a meta explanation for what i was hoping you would say because let's say that the open source code gets abandoned and nobody maintains it anymore. And it, it's forgotten for some reason, just like I guess the writings of hundreds of authors in history have been forgotten and lost. And then someone rediscovers it and builds something on top of it, builds a new movement, provides a new purpose to that code which was written. Mm -hmm. And I, I think this is also an important dimension of open source software because maybe it's not relevant today Maybe it doesn't have a clear purpose that people can figure out. Maybe you're very much ahead of your time. But in the future, someone can discover it and build something on top of what you have done. And you might be dead mm -hmm. for hundreds of years. But someone figures out something. Mm -hmm. And maybe with Bitcoin, it's very practical. It's very, I guess, chasing the purpose. You're trying to solve a problem. You're solving it with your software. But there's also some avant-garde stuff in Bitcoin. And there are proposals that never get added into, they never get merged because people don't really understand what they're for and what they do. So uh, I guess I kind of answered my own question. So I have to come up with a different one. But I, I think you have tackled an uh, interesting question about another challenge when it comes to open source and that's uh, the governance and the decision making in, in, in such a mm -hmm. project. Because since the project is open source, everybody can bring a new idea to the table, but this idea might not be very well aligned with the maintainer's vision for, for, for the project. And then you have this clash, and basically two things can happen. Either the idea is abandoned by maintainers, they don't want to merge it in, and this makes the contributor who came up with the idea sad, or they're have, uh, they have a will to basically fork a project, which, which is a good thing uh, because it's open source. But at the same time, if you have uh, another project fork from the original one, this splits the effort into two, which is, I mean, it's, it's a good thing that we can do that, but it, it's not ideal. And especially in the Bitcoin ecosystem, we all know about all, all, all uh, issues that led to different forks of Bitcoin, but this also happened in lots of other, other different uh, software. One, one good example was uh, FFmpeg library for decoding video streams, and there was a huge clash in the community, and there were two different forks, and it was for almost a decade, it was a horrible mess because some uh, Linux distributions had, had one fork and some Linux distributions had another fork and the video codecs were not compatible and it, it was just very, uh, very confusing for the users because you could play this movie on one uh, operating system but you couldn't play it on another one. So it, it was hurting the user basically. Let's take it back to Bitcoin for a while because this is a Bitcoin conference and we only have about seven minutes left mm -hmm. and we haven't talked much about Bitcoin. Can you imagine a present 14 years later after the Bitcoin code was, was published where maybe Satoshi did not use an MIT license and you'd use something else or if Bitcoin was not open source at all, do you think we would still be talking about Bitcoin? No. <laughs> no, clearly no. Less likely. <laughs> I mean, there were previous experiments, like 
Liberty Dollar, there was eGold. I think there, there uh, was Shoma as well that, uh, that tried to do uh, eCash e -cash one yeah. and it was closed and didn't work out because, yeah. You, you, if your goal is to spread it as far as possible, then you need to put as few barriers as you can. So yeah, it's very important. I think, I think Bitcoin, definitely Bitcoin would not have been here if it was closed source, yeah. Mm -hmm. No doubt about this. Yeah, I, I think Satoshi set a very important precedent in terms of expectations from software. Because from that point on, everything that you build on top of Bitcoin or for Bitcoin, you want it to be just as transparent. And you also did that, Pavel, with hardware. Yeah, uh, we used a little bit different license than uh, Satoshi did for Bitcoin. And he used uh, MIT li license, which is uh, permissive, which means you can basically you can do whatever it, you want to do with the code, including uh, make it, it closed source. And this is a good license to use if you want to be basically everywhere, if you want everybody to use the code. And I don't know, maybe Satoshi wanted to make it possible for companies to deploy Bitcoin also into commercial environments uh, who don't allow the second type of licenses, which we used for Trezor. And this uh, type of license uh, is called copyleft which basically means this is an open source software and if you create any derivative work, it has to use the same license. So the license is called viral, but there are companies uh, such as Apple uh, that don't really like the license because once you introduce that piece of software into your stack, it starts infecting all things around. And uh, I mean, Apple doesn't want uh, really to open source everything around it. So for, for Trezor, we had a different imperative uh, than uh, Satoshi. We wanted uh, every possible uh, fork of clones, uh, fork slash clones of Trezor to use the same license so we could benefit also from other people's work. But it, it, it really depends on what, what, is your, what is your use case. But both licenses, uh, permissive and copyleft, are fully open source. LDK is dual license MIT Apache, which I don't really know nuances of that. I know that we want it to be used really widely and mm -hmm. people can build companies on top of it. And uh, the whole premise of LDK was you shouldn't have to re-implement Lightning to uh, integrate it into your application because that's what uh, people were starting to do, like Electrum and stuff. Um, but yeah, definitely uh, Blue Mat is the one that's in the nuances of why we're dual licensed. But yeah, if anyone knows what, what that means, go for it. <laughs> I, I, I wanted to talk uh, briefly, mention like governance aspect of open source project where like uh, very often, like some people might contribute and get kind of ignored because like also very, what is very important in, in an open source project is kind of the mental bandwidth that is available and like so some person might not get feedback and get a bit uh, down because of that. So the way we try to fix, uh, fix that in BTCP, I think a, a bit, a bit uh, a open source project can become so big and at one point I mean it need to break up in several parts. You saw that with Bitcoin Core, core actually because the first version of Bitcoin was everything. It was a, it was a wallet. It was a UTXO tracker. It was a, it was a poker app. I don't know. I think there was some kind of stuff like this. Also like a marketplace. Yeah, a marketplace. But what we see as as the project grow up, like of course there is more and more contributor. But what you see as well is that all those different functions are actually splitting into projects of their own. Like hardware wallet become a things then. You can use a hardware wallet, but a different UTXO tracker to connect to your node. Then, uh, like now, before all the function that was in one software is breaking up into like 50 different software. So for newcomers, it's kind of very uh, harsh in a sense, but it's just like you know social interaction. Then you, you cannot control. At one point, you cannot control have enough bandwidth to keep everything in a single piece of software. And uh, the way that we're trying to embrace this in a BTCP server, and I think it's important, and I wish that, for example, Bitcoin Core will take this way as well, is uh, to make it possible to make plugins easily. So the idea is that, okay, you have an idea, it doesn't really align with, your pro with uh, our uh, project, and we don't want to spend time reviewing your stuff. So what we're going to do is to 
um, lets you create your own plugin and then market it by yourself and then you can install it. If you need, like, if, if there is a bug to create your plugin, we will help you because it's something we want to do. Uh, but uh, yeah, it, uh, it's a way to manage to have this, you know, breakup of teams without like having everything that is built on like because of one, you know, limited mental bandwidth. So yeah. We only have one minute left, and I want to ask you to encourage others who might be listening and are interested in contributing to open source. Why should they do this? Why should they get into open source as opposed to get a job in a corporation? Except for the things I have already said, uh, for me, the open source was really good way how to understand how things work. Like I said earlier, it was just amazing that the Linux kernel worked on every possible hardware, and if there was some kind of issue, would able to just dig down uh, deeply into the rabbit hole, and by reading, for example, uh, source code, you can understand how the hardware works. And uh, also for me, it was very beneficial that I had the possibility to learn, for example, Electrum code, which is written in Python, to understand how Bitcoin work. Because uh, by just reading the C++ code uh, for uh, Bitcoin D, this was very hard to grasp, while Python was much more approachable. So it's very easy to learn how the things work by studying uh, open source code. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And I also just, yeah, if you're into Bitcoin, I feel like open source is kind of a really natural place to get started because you can get started, whereas you can't get started on closed source Bitcoin projects. So, and um, yeah, it's just really fun. You can use it to learn a language. Like a lot of people work on LDK because they want to learn Rust. So it can be a really good way to do that. And um, yeah, you just get to feel like you're a part of a team. And um, yeah, you should just give it a try.